Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Born Podcast brought to you from our studio here in central Pennsylvania. I'm your host, Nathan Imboden, and on this podcast, we get to champion the message of entrepreneurship and business ownership by interviewing amazing business owners and leaders right here in our community in central Pennsylvania. We like to say we like to we, we get to learn how to start, grow, and run successful organizations, hearing it straight from the mouths of those who have done it. Be sure to find a full replay of our broadcast on our website at questmont.com slash born podcast and also search for the born podcast on all your favorite social media and or uh, podcast apps click that like follow and subscri- subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all these episodes and today we have a great guest a good man jeff coleman who is the founder and ceo of an organization called churchill strategies and i really want to dig into that name because i hear a lot about churchill yeah. personally but i haven't researched him a lot myself, so I really want to do that. But in, in any event, Jeff, welcome to the show. Nathan, Thanks for being is, here. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. I live pretty close by and never knew you were here. And what a beautiful studio you have. Oh, thank you very much. Well, uh, it's a little intimidating when you have somebody who is in the business of doing some production and film and whatnot to to have you come in here. So uh, I hope we don't disappoint. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't you give us a little bit of a background, maybe on you personally sure. first, and then we'll get into the, the business. Well, my background is kind of a um, not a straight line. It's a windy line. It starts in uh, mom and dad meeting in the Philippines and uh, when my dad was stationed there in the Navy. And then mom and dad moved to his, um, to Woodby Island, Washington, where his last uh, assignment was. I was born after they got married and um, then transported across to the East Coast back to his home in New York. Uh, He then felt left, uh, after military service, went into ministry, became a Presbyterian uh, minister. Okay. And uh, then my early life was really almost hopscotching to Africa and, and Asia and South America uh, on missions work. Okay. And then for four years uh, living in the, in the Philippines where my mom is from, mm. uh, learning a second culture, second language, meeting uh, a very big family, a Filipino family. Uh, and then in the late, uh, living through the, the People Power Revolution, the overthrow of, of President uh, Marcos, mm-hmm. which... For anyone living in, first as a, I mean, I spoke Tagalog, I looked somewhat Filipino, but I'm still a foreigner, I'm still mm-hmm. an American citizen, right. living when, and, and being an eyewitness to a regime being overthrown was a formative thing for me. So I came back to America in the late 80s with my parents uh, with, with um, a passion for politics. Hmm. Interesting. And wanting to get into local government, wanting to know everything about it. Um, but when you come in hot like that, you mm-hmm. realize pretty soon that American politics is nothing like politics in a developing country. Yeah. It might look like it. It might have some of the same constitutional elements and rules. Mm-hmm. But the flavor of politics in South America or, or Asia, very different. In what ways? Well, and it's maybe full bigger contact. Picture. Okay. It's full contact. All right. So you're, you, know, you have 20, 30 candidates to choose from. You don't have a two-party system. You have a multi-party system. Okay. Yep. Um, you have uh, rules that are suspended, you know, So the Constitution is the Constitution until Congress changes it. Hmm. And you're living through moments when you see the Constitution changing. Yeah. Um, You have 80% participation in elections, at least 80%. Wow. And so when you go to the polls on Election Day, you look and it is covered like leaves with flyers from the candidates. Hmm. Now, the disappointing part about that is you look, well, how does it really, really work there? It's because people self-fund. And you determine the honor system in a, in a country like the Philippines was back then, um, the amount of money you didn't take for a bribe. If you took the right. lower amount at the polls for your candidate, you were an honorable person. I don't think corruption is that direct, uh, perhaps, anymore, but that's the way it was. Sure. Yeah. I remember somebody, I forget who it was, talked about all the corruption in other countries. Yeah. And it's interesting when we hear about politics in America and the the idea that it's so corrupt and whatnot. But um, I think given all and and is it ideal? I don't know that there is an ideal, um, but there's corruption everywhere. And it and it's way, I think, way worse. Our our minds uh, are (laughs) pre-programmed to think in conspiracy. Yeah. 
And so you can find anecdotal evidence almost in every election f from the beginning of the country forward of people trying to meddle, yeah. trying to say, look, we can stuff the ballot box, we can extend the hours, we can make sure that the dead people are voting, we can buy some votes here. Yeah. But then you look at the, the whole, the big picture, back out a little bit and say, well, on balance, um, you know, would Aaron Burr have been a better president if there was a more honest one? Or right. what if LBJ had lost his first race in Texas? Or what if the Kennedys didn't flip the election in Chicago? All of those moments you think, well, okay, we have what we do. And then there's this whole idea of providence that goes kind of next to it. And you say, ultimately, we're, you know, we are a part of the process, but we're not the full yeah. decider here sure. about who becomes our leader. Sure. All right, so you, you jump into politics, yeah. and how long were you in, in so, politics? Well, I started almost 12, 13, I was volunteering for local races. Okay. So I was in a, in a pretty Democratic area, very young, conservative Republican in Western Pennsylvania. So um, I eventually went to Liberty University, okay. came home from Liberty, uh, challenged a longtime incumbent who was there most of my lifetime in some kind of public office, a very popular guy. My district was almost 70% Democrat. Okay. So they'd never voted for Republican. I had no money, no resources, no nothing. Uh, just it's a perfect place to be. Yeah, yeah. Friends. Yeah. Um, knocked on 10,000 doors wow. and then had a, this is kind of my first experiment in, in branding, was having to have a message that you could deliver at a front porch, when people are cooking, when the dog is barking, when the mailman is coming, uh, when nobody invited you and you're two miles up on a, a back road in Indiana or Armstrong County hmm. in a rural, pretty rural settings, and you knock on the door and the first question is, well, what party you belong to? Now, I, I have the list and I know they're not Republican. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm a Republican, and I'm probably like you. I vote for the person, not the party, right? They go, that's right. Yeah. But I know that they probably have never voted for a Republican. Right. But what, what had been happening, really, is that you had two factors. You had the incumbent, who was not really an active incumbent anymore, was pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, a conservative Democrat by every measurement, mm -hmm. but wasn't active, mm -hmm. wasn't visible. Uh, but then you had this phenomenon of, of the heads of the households who were union household uh, sure, right. uh, dying. And now you had the widows making decisions. So instead of, you know, Frank coming home saying, Evelyn, here's who you're going to vote for. Here's the slate card. Mm -hmm. They began to have the idea that maybe they could vote for somebody else. Yeah. But to break a straight party, which we still had in Pennsylvania in 2000, which is just push one button yep. and we'll take care of all the other races. Uh, now it's gone. Yeah. But those that was a hard barrier to break. Hmm. So interesting. All right. So you do that for how many years? You did two terms. Okay. So two terms. All right. And uh, uh, we went from the minority, and then with my election I went into the majority. So I really only experienced being in a Republican majority. Yeah. Uh, several governors: Rendell, <laughs> uh, Ridge, uh, Schweiker, in that short period of time. So that was a cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, thing to see the movement from one administration to the next. Uh, after retired, got married, proposed to my wife on swearing in day, got right. married a year later. Uh, that was really before any, if you would meet me then and meet me now, uh, back then I was the, voted the most ambitious member of the House. Today, uh, you would not find me the same way. <laughs> I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a softening that happens with marriage and with children sure. for later. Awesome. That changes you and, yeah. and makes priorities different. You have the same convictions, but the way you go about things is very different. So I did two yeah. terms there, uh, then went over to Commonwealth Foundation as their vice president, helped them kind of rebrand Commonwealth Foundation from yep. being um, a cannon firing into the building to yeah. say, look, conservatives have to begin to build relationships. This is all about who and how you treat people. Do you treat them with respect? Do Have you earned the right to listen? Or are you just criticizing, measuring, saying you made a bad vote and mm -hmm. we're coming after you in the next election. Most people by the early 2000s were viewing conservatives as a minor player and a force, but it wasn't until the pay raise a few years later that we began to weld together as an organized group and say, all right, we need to begin to offer policy alternatives. And so my, my role then became kind of the branding of ideas, the positioning of issues and uh, saying, look, I'm sure people are very interested in your white paper and your data. 
Yeah. But what people are more mm -hmm. interested in is your story. And yeah. do you understand people like them? Can you relate to a working class person? Can you relate to someone who doesn't belong to your church, doesn't, isn't a member of your country club, doesn't have kids in private school, isn't on track to go to a four-year degree or a graduate program? Uh, Republicans did a very good job for decades speaking to them. Sure. We did a very poor job of speaking to people who work mm -hmm. and run the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd be remiss if I didn't do a uh, quick shout out to, what do we, we call him our, oh, I think the last one was the Ken Jennings of uh, podcast guests, but Charles Mitchell has been a repeat oh, yes. uh, offender. Good, great friend of You're mine. an offender, Charles. It's okay. Uh, but yeah, he's been on the show many times, uh, which is, uh, has been a pleasure to have him on. All right, so you did a stint for how long with Commonwealth before then uh, launching? Just a full year. Okay, and one year. A year and then launched uh, Churchill Strategy. Okay. And, and that was not a business plan, and that was not, it was born out of necessity, which okay. was there was not a firm for conservative candidates who were running. Okay. Everyone was either connected to the establishment, the, the Republican establishment at the time, uh, which generally was kind of centrist, but more progressive leaning, or at least were accommodating people in the Southeast when it came to fiscal issues, social issues. So if you were a candidate who was challenging uh, the money, the resources, there was not a firm to do that. Mm. So we formed Churchill Strategies really as a legal entity for me to be able to leave Commonwealth Foundation and then help the people who were coming to Commonwealth Foundation Got it. for yep. guidance. And they yep. were coming to, to CF for issues, but to run a campaign is a whole nother mm -hmm. enterprise. Yeah. Okay, so that's how you started, yep. and are you, um, where the business is today, is that still a core focus of yours? Have you branched out into non-political yeah. races and campaigning? What does that look like so the, now? So the, the tagline we've had for Churchill Strategies has been serving consequential leaders and causes. Okay. And, and that definition is a broad one. So yeah. it goes from hospitals to nonprofits to churches to mission agencies to colleges to political candidates, and but the, the, the basic root of an engagement is the same thing, which is to tell someone's story. Mm -hmm. Not to find a story that works, that they can wear, right. but to help explain people's passions and their idiosyncrasies and their unique family story and hmm. life. Um, politics, business, branding has tended to become much, much more clinical, generic, Yeah. Uh, when people see someone who's different and unique, they really gravitate to them, and they're yeah. willing to listen. So yeah. that, this is an exciting time to be in a branding and communications space. I think so, too. Yeah. Well, we've, uh, I, I'm in a Vistage group, and my chair talks about the idea of a buyer's journey versus mm. a buyer's or sales funnel. Mm. And in the sales world, I think a lot of people got used to this idea of, all right, I have this sales funnel where I go from this point to this point to this right. point to this point, and then I siphon them down. And you may still have a process in your sales funnel once somebody gets mm. here to the top of the funnel, but to even get to the top of the funnel, buyers go on this journey because they want to understand and know more about you and what you're about and do you have a competency that right. that is in line with what I need. And, and it takes four, five, eight, ten yes. potential touches, but a big part of that is being relatable to somebody, That's telling right. a story that connects with them. And and the story is what binds you that makes somebody um, a paying customer to a friend in a relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't, I don't want to, I don't want customers. I don't want people who write me checks for the sake of writing checks. I want to yeah. be a part of their life. And if we can help and align in the political world, my job is not to win the election. It's to protect a reputation mm. and to enhance it if we can and to protect a family through a process. Because yeah. the family is usually the one that experiences the most stress, not just the candidate, but the family. Yeah. In a business, it's almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is dad's brand or cousin's brand or your company, your idea that you've nurtured over years. And then, then they... You're hiring an ad company, or you're hiring a, st a strategic uh, partner to come alongside, and and you're there to protect the story. Yeah. You have to know the story almost better than the the client yeah. does. Yeah. All right. You st how many when you launched? Mm -hmm. Did you launch by yourself? Did you have other people that were oh, no, part? It was it was me and uh, a, a designer. Okay. 
in in the truest sense, our company is me and a designer. Okay. And then it is uh, over time we've added some admin staff. We've we've we had a larger staff and then kind of contracted it to now realizing that about five or six people is about optimal. Okay. And then about five or six partners, um, photographers, okay. videographers, yep. uh, designers, additional designers outside of that. I have to have kind of a simpatico relationship with a designer um, because the ideas come from here. They have to find some expression sure. quickly. Sure. I think in pictures and headlines, you know, I'm not reading. You know, you mentioned Charles Mitchell. Yeah. Charles Mitchell is writing and reading volumes. <laughs> yes, he is. I'm creating the cover. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the relationship Charles and I have. Yeah, very cool. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, f a fascinating thing because being able to connect with somebody is a longer process. Yeah. Right. It, it's a it's it's more of it requires more time because you're not. You're not going to just go in and convince somebody immediately. You, they may get a good feeling from you, but you have to be committed to a longer term That's right. journey. And when you're thinking about that, so if, when you work with people, what kind of timelines are you, are you putting on, hey, we're going to put a strategy in place and we're going to implement this, but it's going to take X amount of time for this. And it's probably a little bit different depending on the yeah. situation. I know on your website you talk about crisis management. That's yeah. going to look very different than a rebranding maybe. I but think in 30-day increments. Okay. And I think that you know it takes me about about a month to go deep enough into an organization to hear the song. Okay. You know, who had the back of the napkin idea? Yeah. Who was it? What did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel? What did it sound like the first day when you came up with the idea? Hmm. The years, uh, there's years and years of layering. A political candidate or uh, a country store or a coffee shop. Sure. There, you know, you've, there's the original idea and then sometimes it, it just drifts, an organization drifts because the message has gotten so muddled. Mm -hmm. You see that in a country, you see that in a state, ask people, what's Pennsylvania about? And they say, well, it's, well, what is it really? Is it about your personal expression or was there a big idea that somebody had of religious freedom or expression or entrepreneurship or what was it that yeah. makes us not Ohio? Is it just a river? Same thing with organizations. You know, the borders that define what you are is not the building, mm -hmm. it's not the furniture, it's not your logo. The logo had better look like the people inside. So well, that's, that's probably the most fun part of working through something is I, all I want is for somebody to say, you got us. Yeah, yeah. You got us, that's us. And in a political campaign, you're telling people uh, everything you thought you have to become, just junk that. Mm -hmm. Whatever we have to do to let people know who you are, how you think, how you process, how you learn, if people can connect with that and you actually love people and you enjoy being around people, you're going you're to love this process. It won't guarantee a win, but it will guarantee that you will be competitive. You're not going to be at the bottom. You may not be at the top, or you will have, as in many cases, a decisive election. Yeah. Because people feel this is so different. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to convince people to write that write checks that that is the way mm -hmm. that uh, you need to sell a business or a company. But increasingly, people are so exhausted with all marketing and branding uh, that they want to have. You know, they're gravitating to anything that feels real. Yeah. Sounds like you're doing a pretty deep discovery then with before yeah. anything's coming out. So you yeah. said 30, is is that a typical? Probably about 30 days. Okay. And then, you know, the, the next f two, three months is building product. Mm -hmm. So what is that? Is that collateral? Is that website? Is that, you know, obviously, you know, it's logo, but it's copy. It's, you know, today I was writing copy for an energy company. Hmm. And um, it isn't about, I, you, you, we took this core, kind of core copy that was so directed at the company and flipped it. <laughs> this isn't about you. This is about the story of what my expectations as a customer are. Yeah. What do I, what's my bill of rights? What right. do I deserve? Why was that relationship broken? Why don't people get those expectations from any other place they go? And then what's my plan? Yeah. You know, where, where are you going to take me <laughs> uh, if I engage with you? And then what am I going to feel like afterwards? So you put all that together and then you go, oh, wait a second, we just have a story. You know, once upon a time, there mm. was this place, and it was in this ideal, and then something happened. It got broken. Mm -hmm. And then you ride in, so tell me how you're going to fix it. Mm. Many, many companies and organizations are really focused on product lines, services, 
and it's a way that people know how to engage and talk, yeah. but it really doesn't make a connection. Well, thank you so much for that, and I'll mm -hmm. go on to the next person. Right. What do you offer? We want to just stop the shopping and said, I, I relate to you, I feel good about you, I don't know exactly what you do, but I would like to learn more. And, and, and that allows me, by the way, to yeah. have clients come in and out. Mm -hmm. So they may be gone for five years, or three years, or two months, and I'd never fight for you know somebody called somebody called up yesterday and said hey I th we we hired somebody in house we don't think we're going to need external help I said that's awesome whenever you need us yeah. we'll be here yeah and you can't look at that money going out the door right you have to look at it as that was the right time and yeah maybe they'll need us again someday and are you going to be able to add value to them as well right and if not then on the other on the same side of it you said you're not looking for people who are just going to write checks for you, write That's checks right. to you, but you have to feel convicted about, can I actually add value, and am I, am I, I the right I have fit? to believe, right? I have to believe in them. Yeah. I mean, I may get into it, and, and there have been many clients that I have declined, um, but most of the time when people come now, they're aware of approach or a feel, or I like what you did over here, mm -hmm. can you do that for us? And, um, but you, I have to believe, yeah. I have to get who these people are and what they're doing. And if I can't, I can't make the case. That's where, that's where conscience comes in. Mm -hmm. That's where kind of, uh, in the, the best sense, the right to say respectfully, I think those people are going to be able to, mm -hmm. to serve you a little bit better. They know your brand, your cause, your ethic. Uh, we're in a culture today where everyone is expected to, to take on every cause, mm -hmm. and you really are getting the sense that uh, you're not hearing what people really believe and think. Yeah. Do you have a uh, size of company that is typical in terms of revenue, employees, location, et cetera? Or, no. Okay. Uh, location had, it tends to be uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, but this last month we worked in Mississippi. Okay. I like opportunities to, to get out of my, my sure. places that I know, places that are familiar, and then hear different accents, food, mm -hmm. pace, culture. So whenever I can do it, I, I do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But there is no like. No. You no. We've had some very large organizations, hospitals. Uh, we're working with a pretty a significant food distributor, uh, and then we have small, you know, one, two, three, four person yeah. operations. And and my approach has always been, let's let's come up with a way that is fair to you from a time and compensation standpoint. Sure. Whatever works for you, we'll do it. And I have an idea of how I think, what I think the value of this is, but let's work it out and I just want to make sure that it happens. Yeah. And yeah. And people are very respectful yeah. of your time. I don't guard a lot other than saying, look, at the end of a certain period of the day, I want you to be with your family, I'll mm -hmm. be with mine. Uh, we're going to go dark on Sundays. If mm -hmm. you need me on Saturday morning, we'll reach you. But then once you develop a rhythm of yeah. trust, you don't have panic and anxiety and deadlines that feel artificial mm -hmm. just to create work and value to put on the invoice. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Seems like a different approach in in your, well, I'll call it field, industry, whatever you want to say, yeah. where it, it, uh, it seems it's more... Uh, kind of ripe with what you just described on the maybe negative characteristics yeah. uh, of a lot of maybe pressure, deadlines, uh, what Correct. Yeah. And I had been on both sides of it. Yeah. I mean, you start out in a political world, you are starting out immediately saying, these are 24-hour days. Yeah. And in some ways, I have to be available for a crisis. You know, so if a candidate gets attacked, Within about 30 minutes, I have to know what the response is going to be. Mm -hmm. If a candidate has a value system, it's never a question. Yeah. Because they're going to say, I disagree with this, but I respect my opponent. I wish they would do it differently, but here are the facts. Mm -hmm. And then you move mm -hmm. and you go back to your plan. Mm. We're not distracted by it. We don't spend time defending ourselves. We don't spend a whole lot of money, resources, worrying. About so, so I can tell them, just take a breath. Uh, the attention span of the public is, is about 30 seconds on this. The attack wasn't credible, or I have to assess if it is credible. Sure. And then we, we move into perhaps a little more, maybe a 48-hour period talking about the issue they care about. But no, I don't want people in crisis. I don't want them in fear. I don't want them to be making decisions out of fear. Sure. 
Um, if we don't do this, this will happen, you know, or the odds are. Um, I think you, you do a lot of defensive work. It's billable, and you can make a lot of money that way. You don't end up with relationships. Right. And you don't end up with people who trust you. <laughs> so. Yeah. How do you, how do you try to measure or, how, or do you measure and track results for with, or with the strategies that you're putting in place? Because I would imagine yeah. it's going to be different when you're talking about pure marketing versus maybe branding. That's a great question. Um, so w it's a great question because in, say you take one aspect of our business, which say might be social media, and nobody has been able to come up yet with a way to precisely measure because so much of it feels like it's really about impression. Sure. You're creating a conversation. Mm -hmm. What I, I like to measure by um, more along the lines of a verbatim. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I hear, if I read polling, I really want to read what the verbatim was. What did they actually say? What are the words that came out unprompted when you said my product's name, my candidate's name? Not, did I lead you down this path of kind of informed information? And if you knew these facts, do you feel positively or negatively about that? I'd rather have just a straight up, hey, what do you think of him? Mm -hmm. What do you think of her? How do those glasses look on him? How do those, do, do you like his shoes? You, hmm. let, give me your impression. Yeah. That's where a voter uh, of consumer is going to end up at the end anyway. Yeah. They may give you a lot of reasons, but in the end it's going to be, ah, I just don't feel good, I don't feel right, I don't know what it is, it's just yeah. weird, it's sure. strange, whatever. Um, but for contributors, for example, in politics, you have to have certain measurements. So I think a lot of people artificially inflate, especially in the consulting world, they're saying, look, we're going to put this many gross ratings points uh, behind this particular ad, or we reached 375,000 homes, mm -hmm. or we knocked on 82,000 doors. It doesn't yeah. matter. Right. Because I can feel when I go on the ground, if I'm in Pennsylvania and I land in Mississippi, and I've been running a campaign from Pennsylvania and I haven't tested it, and mm -hmm. I land on the ground and the first person I knock on say, hey, have you heard of my product, my candidate, my cause? It's, mm, no idea. Yeah they don't have an opinion or hmm. they've there's just no awareness i know that it's not working so more of what i do you know is, is much more intuitive um there's a gut level to this yeah it's uh, i don't want to say it's a divining rod but i i think look what you're trying to protect is the character and the integrity of the person or the organization if at the end of a process that usually savages reputations Mm -hmm. and destroys people, if those relationships are stronger, if people don't feel guilty, for a candidate, does your, does the person you defeated feel like they can call you up and congratulate you? That's my win. Yeah. You right, know. right. Which is a different question than did they call you and congratulate you? Correct. It's did they feel like it or were they comfortable Correct. doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. In, in, if you're helping a company navigate through um, a media storm or a crisis, one of the measurements that I'm going to look at are the husband and wife who run the business or the board of directors. Are they more cohesive before or after? Mm -hmm. Was this an exercise that brought them together or did it destroy them? You know, are you positioned for the next opportunity to insert your brand into the marketplace yeah. or have you burned up that brand equity in order to save a few dollars on the on the margins mm -hmm. and that's you know that's that all goes to motive motivation yeah so that leads a lot to culture yeah. and in hmm. your organization it sounds like um you're setting a pretty different culture but how, how would you define <laughs> the the culture you've tried to build within within your organization so our it's always just been a team and it has always been um communication as needed, open all day. So, you know, our Google or back in the day it was, uh, you know, there are just different tools we've used yeah. during the day that have allowed us to just communicate. Hey, mm -hmm. do you see this? Do you see this? Can you, what, what's your take on this? So everyone helps yep. everyone that way. But it has always been when I hire somebody, it is never, I'm offering a position at this amount. Would you, will you take it? And they say, well, no, I'd like 5,000 more. It's what do you need to support your family? Hmm. I want you to be a part of this organization based on everything I've seen. I think it's going to be awesome. Can we do this? And if I can make it work and they can make it work, that's how the salary is arrived at. When they need more, they tell us they need yeah. more. Um, healthcare, you know, we're going to pay healthcare. 
not I don't want to figure out how can I get fifty dollars from the employee to, to help. It's just part of what you what you're going to get when you work for me because I don't want people thinking about do I have to pay for the dentist or not or yeah. do I have to pay for that test. Just take care of that so we can keep yeah keep going and then just protecting. Um, I think probably at the beginning before children it was much more. I wanted the company to be all together as much as we can. Yeah. Picnics, planning, working, retreats, and all that. And now I don't think I need to have as many of that, those kinds of interactions. Sure. You know, we all know the lane we're in, yeah. what we're doing, and then just trusting um, that that when it gets done, it's going to get done right. And, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool team. Yeah. So. I would bet if you're, if you're more of a linear, logical thinker, you might look at that and say, well, you're, you're spending more than you would need to right. to maybe get a person like this or the same right. quality and education or whatnot. Um, but you're creating an environment that is sticky and lasting because people are feeling, they feel heard, valued, Correct. appreciated, seen in a different way. That's right. D do you have issues with turnover with people or? No, what we have had is, um, if, if we have had to say I'm a little too top heavy on administrative help and I need to start doing more things myself. You know, if I realize that someone really, it's a uh, eight to 10 hour job, but really it's taking two or three, so maybe it's better as a part time. Mm -hmm. Because we have that trust, I can say, here's the reality of where we're, what do you think? Yeah. And we'll, generally arrive at the same conclusion. You know, we're doing that now with healthcare, finding the right healthcare plans sure. for everybody saying, look, do we need a group or should we find a way to get to pay for individuals or yeah. pay for your deductible? How do we do that that works best for you? Um, I think the human resource management approach or policy and procedure manuals are all generally focused on a defensive <laughs> You know, how do you protect the company, the bottom line, the assets, with all the covenants and agreements and contracts? And you may you may win, but my my goal is not to to win. My goal is to have relationships with people, yeah. which means you're probably going to have more exposure. Yeah, you know, you're going to be more open to a lawsuit, but that means you are just going to have to treat people respectfully. Right, <laughs> and you can't do things that would lead to you know a yeah. lawsuit, but. Um, so it's a novel concept. <laughs> yeah. Try to not do things today that aren't going to lead to a lawsuit. I mean, knock that down. That, that's a <laughs> that's a, a challenge for me today, Joy. Thank you. <laughs> I, I've also tried not to put uh, kind of assign numerical values to people yeah. that say, "Look, um, in politics, I think that was something immediately you feel like I'm going to this person writes a twenty thousand dollar check every year." So I'm going to have to build time in to maintain that relationship. That's the thought, yeah. right? And I don't want to have that kind of value assigned to that. I just want to engage with people. And if that means that it's it, that eats up two hours, it ends up working out really well. Yeah. And if at the end of the day, you've just spent 20 minutes engaging with the person who's serving you food, and you've spent maybe another 20 minutes uh, with a client. As long as I'm not rushing it yeah. and I'm finishing the thought and they ha they're they heard and they've been able to speak, it's hmm. just treating each other with with dignity yeah. and seeing another person. And I don't think you can, th that's something you can practice without almost becoming a very strange person, you know, because it's like, <laughs> yeah. you really have to say, I'm in this business, I love people, or else do some programming, do something else yeah, that exactly. doesn't require yeah. more direct contact with yeah. people. That's fascinating. I could talk a lot longer about that. In fact, if you're willing to, offline, I'd love to talk yeah, a lot more it. about that yeah. because there is a, it is a, it's, it feels like the antithesis of what is usually pushed, particularly from a business standpoint, which yeah. is much more in a box, you know, yeah. metrics, numbers, you know, well, you can't, uh, you got to treat everybody the same or you got to, you know, you have to Correct. have this set standard of procedures. And I've personally, I've, I've internally been f fighting that yeah. as it needing to be a norm, but uh, you're actually one of the first people that I've talked to that is 
applying it. Well, I'm experimenting with it, yeah. right? It sure. has a, been a lifelong experiment to say, really, can I really do it this way? Yeah. Can I really not remind people, hey, you owe us some money? Yeah. Um, or can I really not say, hey, just following up, just want to know if you're still interested. Can I just do what I do and they do what they do and then at the right time we will connect? Yeah. I, so I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting and kind of letting more and more and more things out of my control. And yeah. what I'm finding is that I am not anxious at the end of the day. I do not have a list of things that I haven't done. Yeah. And I am going through and saying, look, the, the rule is engage fully with the person in front of you. Mm -hmm. And then everything else over the course of the day works. Yeah. It really does. And that means you're fully present at home. That means you're fully present with your kids. I wasn't a good dad, I think, at the very beginning because I was so frenetic and mm. intense. Sure. I'm thankful that my, I didn't have my children in the early years of politics because I wouldn't have known their names. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that I can tell you their birthdays or I know what they like or what their personality is like really surprises me <laughs> from people that know me from those from early those early days. days. Yeah. I don't recognize yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And, and I'm not saying I couldn't go back. Sure. Because if you don't put those those barriers and walls up and you don't have Absolutely. honest people, yeah. it's going to go back. Absolutely. Well, I think reality is we will always be in an experiment because yeah. what works today might not work three years from sure. now or five years from now, and what works then might not work five years from then. So we're always in this experiment. I'm, I'm thinking constantly about, because wh whenever I encounter someone 80 and over, I, I really compare and measure and say, do I want to be like that? Yeah. And I had to write a, <laughs> a eulogy this last week, and I go, and the guy was, a friend of mine was 55, and I go, um, he, he really and it died well. It was unexpected. Nobody thought it was coming. Mm -hmm. I think he may have had an idea that it was coming. Okay. But um, when you walk out of the room and the paper's on the desk and and I, I was looking at text messages today because I wanted to find said, well, he sent that to me. So yeah. I looked and, so, and I realized I can't follow up with the question, yeah. right? But he left the field in a way that doesn't leave any ambiguity about who he cared about, who he loved. Yeah what people thought of him, he was saying it in the moment. And those are the things I think that people really regret, is when you walk through Harrisburg, when you walk through you know, any shopping center and you see people walking alone mm -hmm. or sitting alone or drifting, you go, there is a, a such, such, uh, these are all many of them who've, who worked their lives. Mm -hmm. They worked for that retirement day, and then there was no vision for life afterwards, and yeah. they're alone. And they go, how do you prevent that? You know, how do you have a lived life and then have people actually want to continue the conversation until the yeah. end hmm. and not become bitter? Um, so those are the things that you think, all right, while I'm doing this, that is not a later thing. That's mm -hmm. a thing you have to be doing now. Yeah. If you want to have lifelong relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. There's a lot there. Very much a lot and there. And I'm learning. I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm still learning because, um, you know, I if I will overcommit or I will say I'd like to do that for you, but I can't do that, and I realize as it's coming out of my mouth that I can't. Yeah. So now I'm getting better at least of what I'm not committing to and saying, well, it's not that one doesn't end with me. Sure. I am part of a chain of people that are going to help that person. Sure. You know, we're not, I don't have to drive them all the way to Kentucky today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can do my part, but I'm but I can't ignore it. I think that's the responsibility. In Harrisburg, we have almost an institutional class of people who are experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. And there are two, uh, many approaches. You know, do I, do I make eye contact? Do I not? Uh, do I say, and my wife and I were talking about this, say, well, we probably should take it to the next level and at least say, do you need help? Mm. Is there somewhere you need to be? Can we help with that? Mm -hmm. But I can't just ignore it yeah. and say, well, you're not a human being because you're begging and you should get a job. I have to th think much more critically about those encounters. Yeah. Um, so, and working in Harrisburg in the capital coming here, you have a stream of people, especially if you're in politics, who want something from you. Yep. But if you are just there to really engage with people, it's the most refreshing thing. Yeah. Like yeah. people actually ask you a real question. Yeah, it is. It is. All right. 
Yeah. I have uh, one question, one sure. more question, and it's the one that I usually wrap up an interview with because yep. it gets a little bit, well, you've, you've already done a lot of getting to the heart of who Jeff is uh, and what your organization is about, but what I'd like to ask is if you were to look ahead, say, mm -hmm. five years, mm -hmm. what would have to happen over the next five years for Jeff to look back and say, yeah, these were five successful years and I feel like, I feel like it's been a good run. That's a, that's a great question. I think it comes when people say things like, hey, how can I pray for you? People yeah, ask sure. me. I say, well, what, do you, what, what is it? I, there's not a thing that I want. I'm not wanting, like, please pray that I get this second hmm. house or I get this car or that I'm able yeah. to afford something or I can pay for college. Or, I'm, I'm, I think more about um, how do I stay in the moment and not get kind of distracted by things ideas by concepts by uh, little ambitions that mm -hmm. keep me away from what really matters I'm kind of at the point now I ran for lieutenant governor a year ago and with the strangest experience of that whole journey was that it was a six-month uh, engagement and I went in with a message to talk I wanted to talk about civility and and decency and and public life. Mm -hmm. And we did well in central Pennsylvania and some parts of the state, but I didn't get the nomination. I didn't second guess that. Mm -hmm. Now, that would have been, a 25-year-old <laughs> Jeff would have been devastated by yeah. it. I mean, it would have just destroyed me to think, oh my. I, and then every day after would have been, I can't believe something that was supposed to happen didn't happen, and what did I do wrong? In this case, it was the best experience I've ever had in politics because we loaded up the RV, you know, shrink wrapped, fun, uh, <laughs> gave speeches, talked about what I wanted, and then at the end of the campaign, we had a big party, and then it was over. And then we went back to regular life the day after. Yeah. And all of my opponents and I were friends. There were ten of us, and we were friends at that's the end great. of it. Yeah. And so, so that's what I want that experience again and again and again. I yeah. don't want five or ten or fifteen years to say. I was, I get this little idea in my head and then it sucks all of the energy and the life of the people around me and then I have to go back and repair mm -hmm. all these relationships because I sucked all the life. Yeah. And that would describe pretty aptly a 25 year old, mm. very ambitious, we're going to be here for two terms, then we're going to run for Congress, then we're going to run for yeah. Lieutenant Governor, then we're going to run for Governor and then wherever yeah. it goes, it goes, yep. right? Yep. I don't set goals. I really don't. Hmm. I, I, I can I fight the notion of having a goal because to me at that point, and there's some goals like personal goals, you know, relational goals, who I want to be, not hmm. what I want to become. Um, but sometimes setting a goal feels like I'm throwing a stone and then I'm just running artificially towards it sure. to create energy. Sure. Workout goals, food goals, whatever that is. I really have to have something that's much bigger. and. The little, what feels like something little, which is just fully being here, mm. is, has changed everything. Yeah. And um, so. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Very awesome. All right. Well, <clears throat> if people are watching here yeah. and they're hearing what you're saying, which is, in my opinion, very different, very unique, and they're thinking, you know, I need that in my corner to help tell my story, whether it's an organization, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for-profit, non-profit, whatever it is. What's the best way for them to learn about you and your organization and, and possibly um, get in contact with you? Uh, my website's churchillmedia.org. Okay. Um, my office is uh, right on Front Street, 23 North Front, next to the library and the Arts Center, right there yep. across the little pedestrian bridge. Uh, but coffee, um, call Donna at my office and <laughs> she'll she'll find a time in the calendar. And, um, and often people think they need a tool or a logo, mm -hmm. or a brand, or a something mm -hmm. to make them different. When yeah. really they just need somebody to just get just get back to what you were doing at the <laughs> very beginning. If that's what you love, yeah, and, um, and enjoy every minute. Awesome. So awesome. Well, we'll have your website and contact information in our show notes and uh, whatnot for people to to reach out if, if they feel so compelled. But Jeff, this has been a pleasure. It's been my It's pleasure. been a blast. Uh, you, I've, I've learned a lot from you. It is really refreshing to hear, I think, just a very unique and different take on not only how to run an organization, but how to view individuals on the other side of an engagement, how to view people in general. And uh, so I 
thank you for what you're That's doing and the I'm still learning. Uh, impact yeah. that you're having on on uh, on our community here. And uh, it's been, uh, again, a pleasure. So everyone at home, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, reach out to uh, Jeff and Churchill if, uh, if what he was saying connects with uh, what really you feel like you need uh, in telling a story and really um, uh, expressing to individuals what, uh, what you're really about. So everybody at home, thanks again. We'll see you on the next episode of The Born Podcast.